I will start with my talk station. This is uh, what actually I want to zoom it. Yeah. You can see the screen now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. okay. So these are uh, basically yeah. my personal experiences, what mistakes I did, and this is I'm going to present you so you have an idea. Basically, talks is a one big day having 14 stations. Okay. And the good thing about the talk station is that uh, it's basically task assessment or uh, uh, task assessment. Uh, uh, task as so TOACS, task oriented assessment of clinical skills. Okay, yeah, yes, so the good thing about this is marking system you can get eight or nine marks, even. Okay, there is no memorization needed, they will not ask for you from percentages, and the examiners are very calm. Okay, uh, okay. The, 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 the bad thing about any exam in Pakistan is like you have polio, CP, and tendon transfers. And for that, you have to have a higher order thinking. It's, 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 it is difficult, really. Okay. Uh, the other thing about our station in, in, in our country is that they are test. It's not like a rapid fire, frankly. Uh, when I went to the stations, I thought it will be like, just quick, give me answer. No, eight minutes are enough. So the guy will tell you that this is like ward rounds and you are doing rounds. So don't yeah. even panic. Okay. Be relaxed. These are the stations which come normally in the exam. Sorry. A trauma case, a tumor case, okay? Uh, a, a sports related injury, like a dislocated in knee or shoulder, polytrauma case, they will give you one implant, you will test the mangle extremity, they will do pedia. Pedia, there is big three DDH, slip, slip capital femoral lipids, and perthes. They will test it. Fine. They will give you a simple case in spine. No big deal. In infections, they will test these osteomyelitis, septic arthritis in general, the way you treat in the world. They may ask for one procedure. For me, there was no procedure. But actually, they asked me how you approach and give me that. But normally, it's like distal femur or radius ulna, something like this, simple. And there is a, always an emergency. Emergency means like dislocation, compartmental syndrome. They can check test test you in pre-op uh, managements like uh, ARDS, fat embolism, pre-op like DVT. And there is one surprise always, like either there is a scaphoid, tailless, or neck of femur non-union. So I will start with my stations. This was my first station, and uh, I was very lucky to have the station. Uh, the examiner asked me this. You are a consultant and professor has advised you to fix this structure one month old. How will you proceed? What investigation you will do and how you fix it? I know this, these were not random questions. If you first ask me the question, how you fix this? And then I ask me, describe this x-ray. So I describe the x-ray, there is a fractured neck of femur. And I can see uh, some uh, calcification. And I think that, that, that was the only thing I, I, I did. I, I was tense. But then after he asked me how you fix it and that I like, I, I buzzed it. I, I almost like took 10 out of 10 from him. Basically over here, if you see the fracture, it's looked like garden type four. It's okay. Yeah. But actually he yeah, wants sir. you this power classification because now it's a neglected neck of femur fracture. Any fracture which is more than three weeks and not united, it's a neglected neck of femur fracture. So I described the power classification. And he shifted me and my, he told me, what about the fracture line? So I told him it's like horizontal fracture is unstable and this, so it's classified like this, one, two, three. Okay, you have to remember this. So I will admission, my concern is head viability. I will do osteotomy and grafting. This fracture will not heal with simple conservative measures like fixing it with a DHS derotation screw or, a, or, a, or any AO screw fixation cannot help. We have to do something. The biology of the fracture, the mechanics of the fracture, sorry, is such that it, it will need some intervention. So he told me what intervention. I told him I will do osteotomy or either do grafting. Grafting, I said bone grafting, vascular or non-vascular. What investigation? And I said about MRI, viability of head. He told me what other investigation you can do. I told him I don't know any other investigation except MRI. And you can tell him. There are bone scans, but bone scan will not get positive in this time. Okay. And osteotomy okay. is always needed. Okay. okay. So it's actually neck of femur fracture defined as more than 30 days by my retal. 
and difficulty is that 60% of the cases will go into ABM. 60% of the cases will go into it. There are no clear guidelines for this and uh, bone grafting alone with internal fixation will not work. Okay, so it's better to always do uh, osteotomy. He asked me what, why it does not unite by the way. So uh, the answer is that there is no cambium layer of periosteum in the, inside, the, uh, the, uh, inside the joint. Second is the blood supply is precarious. The blood supply of your head is precarious. And the hematoma is washed out. Why? Hematoma is washed out because of synovium. Synovium out. sites will synovium sites will absorb all the blood out. It is not like the same oh, okay, okay. fractures, which is tibia fibula fracture, and there is a hematoma, and this will become into change into a callus formation, and there will be osteoprogenitor cells and transformation. Nothing will happen here. It everything will be washed out at, at once because blood by itself. All right. Okay. okay, I will mute you all now, okay? Yeah. So, basically, hematoma is always washed out inside the joint, so union is no, of no use. It will not unite. Trying to... I think I'm stuck. Okay, so treatment option is internal fixation with osteotomy and bone grafting. They will ask you what type of osteotomy. There are two types of osteotomies, Powell Y and Muller 1 or McMurray, medial displacement osteotomy. This medial displacement osteotomy is a obsolete. We don't do it. Okay, so there are any, many other osteotomies, but basically most of the osteotomies are either on the, uh, at the level of the greater trochanter or subtrochanteric region. So what type of osteotomies these are? Just I will go, I think the slides are hanging. You can hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's, it's a long story, I don't know why it's hanging. Uh, these Powell, Muller, or McMurray are the same ones or different? No, I will show you the, I will show you the osteotomies. He asked me this osteotomy and I told him, and he was very happy. This you don't need. Powell, why you need to know? Because your all examiners are doing Powell, why? All of them are doing Powell, why? I told him I will do McMurray. He told me why McMurray if Powell is doing so good. So I did not have any answer of that. Uh, I don't know why it's hanging. Okay, osteotomy problem is that it, is, it has shortening and reduced range of motion. Okay, the other options which they are in the exam are mild muscle pedicle flap and vascularized pedicle flap. These are by the Urbanike or Myers. You don't need to know it, but you should have an idea why you need vascular graft. What is the need? So uh, basically this is classification. I took this from Sandu et al paper. Uh, I, I, I have read that paper before you're going to exam. Uh, actually, uh, Sorry, sir, he, which, what, what was the name of the paper? Sandu et al, Sandu, S-A-N-D-H-U. He's a, he's an Indian, uh, orthopedic surgeon, very renowned guy, and he had a very nice paper. So actually he said that for a neglected patient aged less than 60, more than 60, we should go for THR, okay? okay? And a neglected patient less than 60, I will go for internal fixation and any, any of the osteotomies or vascularized bone graft. What he was saying that more than 60, total hip replacement is a treatment. And less than 60, irrespective of AVN, I will fix the fracture. I will do the osteotomy, do the bone grafting, and fix it with a DHS. While we find osteotomy and then do a DHS. Why? Because 
even by itself does not cause any problems. You can buy time with it. But total hip replacement, any total hip replacement has a half life, has a life of 15 to 20 years. Okay? So you buy time with it. So this is basically power osteotomy. If you see, uh, at the level of greater trochanter, he has taken a Y sort of, a, v, v sort of osteotomy. The, the, the proximal limb is transverse, is horizontal, sorry. Okay? The proximal limb, if you see, is transverse, is straight line. And then you made an angle and you do the vulgifying, remove this bone chuck and do the vulgus and put a DHS. Are you getting it? Yes. Yeah. Then this is the power base, basics. A guide pin is inserted from the greater trochanter to the head of the femur. One limb of the osteotomy is made at the base of the greater trochanter. It's a transverse limb, a straight line. Excuse me, the <laughs> silent is. <laughs> okay, okay. okay, so basically, the distal limb of the Y then passes upward and medially to reach the proximal limb, and a wedge of bone with the required correction is removed from the proximal aspect of distal fragment with its base directed laterally. Just read it around, just see the diagram, and you will understand it. I have again a problem. TV is a bank, and they are running. Yeah, can you mute switch off the TV? Or, or mute your mics, please. Excuse me, who is this? Dr. Yunus? Can you listen to me? Actually, again, the slides are hanged. Sir, you mute your camera better, sir. Mute your camera. Yeah, I will mute it. I will mute it. I will mute it because the thing is, there is a time limit in this. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I will mute it again. Okay. So basically, the Muller is different. Muller osteotomy is basically a only small V sort of wedge from the lateral aspect. And that wedge is, dis is, 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 is moved on the medial aspect. Okay. So there is less amount of shortening in the Muller osteotomy. So then after I had a second station, which was a hellas. It was a hellas vulgus deformity. He asked me to export is this. I told him it's a hellas vulgus. The, 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 the first ray is, is, is over the second ray. I can see sclerosis, I, uh, osteopenia. I can see joint line incongruity. Uh, I can see not much of osteophytes, by the way. He asked me, what is the diagnosis? I told him this is a hellas vulgus deformity. And probably there is underlying disease like psoriatic arthritis and crossing spondylitis or any inflammatory disease or um, whatever it can be. So he told me to draw lines. So Hellas with arthritic changes and he asked me to draw lines and I, I discussed these things in a very simple layman terminology at that time. So these are the angles which you need to remember. Uh, what is intermetatarsal angle, hellas vulgus angle, distal metatarsal articulation angle, and interphalangeal angle. You have to always remember this. You can draw, you should draw it. And you can be able to draw it. Because he gave me a white paper and told me, put over the x-ray and draw it. So when he draw, I draw, he asked me a simple question, what you will do with this patient? And I told him I will offer him a, 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 a arthrodesis. He told me, why arthrodesis for the first ray? So I told him that it's a arthritic joint, patient has underlying disease, I cannot do osteotomy, osteotomy, the patient will come back and it will disease will aggravate with the passage of time. And uh, so he was very happy, but he told me clinically what you will check. So 
intermetrasal fat pads, migration, callosities. I will check the skin condition. I will check any inflammatory condition if it's underlying around that area, and I will assess it clinically. So, my case, it was it's, it's a rheumatoid helix. So, fuse or not to fuse depends on the age of the patient. But less than 55, you should go for a arthrodesis. Less than 55 years, not English. And above 70, you do resection arthroplasty. The problem is it's flat pad migration, and you have to aim for a planty grade foot. Uh, he asked me how much duration biological agents are stopped. I told him two weeks, and demands is no issue. I didn't knew I didn't knew about this because he asked me about methotrexate. I said I don't know, and he asked me something else, and I said I don't know. So how you fix it is hind foot should be all rheumatoid arthritis. Hind foot should be always before forefoot, unless if the hind foot is flexible. So these are the Hellas valgus angles. You should remember this, that the Hellas angle normal is less than 15, mild is 15, 20, moderate 20 to 40, and severe more than 40. I think you know better than me for this. So if the intermediatorsal angle is less than 13, a Hellas valgus angle is less than 40, you do the distal osteotomy. Maybe it, it may be chevron or any other type of osteotomy. If the Hellas valgus angle is more than 40, you do proximal osteotomy. The, the most renowned is, is, is a scarf. And he may ask you how you do scarf. So just remember to draw it on a, on a, on a paper, the, the, the limbs of the scarf osteotomy. Uh, any patient who comes with an age younger than like 30 and 20, sorry, and you have to check for the uh, instability of the tetrasometrasal joint. Uh, Intermetrasal angle will be high in those patients in juvenile type, and you have to do osteotomy or a lepidus procedure for that. Uh, for any arthritic patient, you buzz off and tell him, I will do the fusion. Uh, if there is an increased distal metatarsal articulation angle, you can do the, the redirection osteotomy and hellas vulgus interphalanges, you will do the Atkin osteotomy. This was my third station. Uh, I don't want to know, tell you about the name of the consultant, but he asked me a simple question. He told me, what is this? I told him it's a dislocation. He told me, what is the dislocation? I told him it's a posterior medial dislocation and I was wrong. So if you see this x-ray, he asked me, the type of dislocation, I told him this is a postulated knee dislocation, posterior medial knee dislocation. He told me how dislocation is defined. I told him the, the integrity and the position of the distal part of the joint will give me an idea that with which dislocation it is. So I told him, he asked me, where is the distal part now? So I told him, it is trans, it, it, is, it, it is laterally and posteriorly. So he told me, what is this location? I told him, this is posterior lateral dislocation. He said, so you told me posterior medial, doctor. So he corrected me. He fixed my mistakes. So he told me, how will you reduce it? Is this dislocation common? Is it reduci re reducible? How and which side to approach? Vescular injury signs? How you proceed? External fixator? Where will be the pins? What ligaments you will do and when? And what are the long-term side effects of if there is no vascular injury? So this was a postulatal dislocation, and you have to remember the vascular signs, like hard and soft signs. And the problem is that cold, insensate, with no pulse, you have to still reduce the dislocation. After reduction, you have to assess the neurovascular deficit. Still cold, you can do the ankle brachial flex in this, uh, ankle brachial index, ABI. Uh, if more than 0.9 is reassuring. If he asks you if it's more than 0.9, you will discharge the patient? No, you will admit the patient. Because most of these lacerations are intimate lacerations. So they can end up into a vascular catastrophe within 48 to 72 hours. So clinical assessment, you can do selective angiography. Remember the word selective. You don't do angiography in, any, in all the patients. Uh, he asked me what this type of dislocation was. I told him postural dislocation. So the problem with this is that the medial femoral condyle Is, is, is buttonholed through the capsule. The medial femoral condyle is buttonholed through the capsule. So what approach you will do for this is medial, not posterior. So 
knee dislocations are most commonly anterior or posterior, medial or lateral, or rotatory. Rotatory in the rotatory posture lateral is the most common. Shank classification, it's a KD1 is dislocation with PCL or ACL intact. KD2 is both ACL and PCL are lost. Two is for two, so ACL, PCL lost. KD3 is ACL, PCL with medial collateral ligament or lateral collateral injury. KD4 is torn all four ligaments, PCL, PCL, PM, PML, and PLC. PML is posterior medial ligament, and PLC, posterior lateral palmar. And KD5 is frank dislocation, complete fracture dislocation. So, so this is an algorithm. I took it from Miller. Uh, basically, any dislocation which is coming to you, irrespective of pedal pulses being present or absent, should be reduced. If it cannot be reduced, it should be opened. If once reduced, you have to reassess the pulsations. If it is absent, then you have to do duplex ultrasound and these percutaneous EDH or arteriogram or CT arteriogram. If the ankle brachial plexus is reassuring, then you go for knee, knee MRI and reassess if, 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 what ligaments you, have, you can reconstruct. But if the ankle brachial plexus is less than nine, you have to do the arteriogram and do a vascular plantar repair. So remember, selective angiography. Don't say I will shift the patient to the vascular suit. Uh, another patient, this stage came to me, this was fine case. He showed me this x-ray or a CT image and told me what is this? So I told him spondylitis C cell 5S1. So what question he asked me were very interesting. He told me, describe this x-ray. I described this x-ray. He said, what might be the age of the patient? What is the single best image view? How you classify it? How you grade it? What are the neurological deficits in this patient? And reduce to not reduce. This, uh, he didn't ask me this question, but this was the only thing which, which were asked for me. So when I described this x-ray, I was able to describe the x-ray and everything, but neurological deficit when it came, I said S1. Actually, L5 S1, the neurological deficit is L5, not S1. And he, he asked me again that, can, and I, I was too rigid at that time. I told him, it is S1. That's it. I don't know. This will be S1. So what is, this, what is the problem with S1? What, what are the neurological deficits? He asked me S1. He told me, okay, this patient has L5 now. So what will be there? So he, I, I told him that the, 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 the sensation we lost on the lateral aspect of the calf. And he was okay with it. So this is spondylysis L5 over S1. This is overpopulation, older population, and it's a degenerative type. Single best X-ray is oblique view, not lateral view. Uh, Newman classification should remember: dysplastic one, two isthmic, three degenerative, four post-traumatic, five pathological, and six post-surgical. So he asked me what grade it is. I told him my ding grade two. So grade one is less than 25, two is 25 to 50, three is 50 to 75, and four is 70 to 75 to 100, and five is spondyloptosis. So how you draw this? I, I, they, he didn't ask me this to draw this diagram, but he asked me how you, how you measure it. So normally you draw a line on the superior border of the, of, of the, of the displaced uh, uh, the vertebra, and you, 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 you draw a, a straight line from the posterior aspect of the sacrum, and you measure the sacrum. So it will give you, actually measure you the local kyphosis at the region of the So whenever you have a spondylitis case, the risk of progression is number one is age, second is female sex, slip angle more than 10 degrees, and higher grade slip, the more chances that you will slip. There are also other factors I removed those two for just presentation sake. Uh, these are the slip angle, pelvic incidence, and sacral slope. But I don't think so. You will be examined for that in such situation. So grade one or grade two, L5 S1, you have to do postulatal fusion and uh, or tension band wiring of the past defect with with or without bone grafting. 
and type 3, 4, 5 are L4 to S1 fusion. Remember L5 to S1 fusion and L4 to S1 fusion. Reduction, still until now, it is controversial. They will not ask you anything controversial exam. Another station which I had there was this X-ray. He told me to describe this X-ray, and I told him that this patient has a fractured tibia, and it looks like an atrophic non-union pseudarthrosis. And I was right regarding pseudarthrosis. So he asked me, describe this X-ray. Can you classify? And he was very happy when I told him the classification because he told me no one told me any classification. So he told me that how uh, how you differentiate at clinics by not doing x-ray pseudarthrosis are not painful the patient has a long history of being non-painful uh, the the pseudarthrosis is being non-painful only the deformity is there you have to remember that you have to remember that the deformity can be either anterolateral posterior medial or posterior lateral, and you should differentiate it that which one is pathological and which one will be treated without any intervention uh, he asked me, the patient has cafe or late spots, what are the other situations, what surgery you will do, what are the principles of surgery. So, this is an anterolateral deformity, normally. Not anteromedial, because anteromedial is, 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 a, is a deformity in a newborn and it is corrected without any intervention. Classified by Boyd. So, I made Boyd simple for my exam. One has bowing and a defect. The tibia will be bowed. Two has a hourglass deformity without any fracture. Three has a cyst on X-ray. Four has no narrowing in the med narrowing in the medulla. Five is a dysplastic fibula. Six has an intraosseous schwannoma. One is good and two is bad. And neurofibromatosis is a switch with type two and six. So the treatment for is is are different types. If there is no fracture, you can do a bracing or clamshell orthosis. Uh, uh, if you want to do reduction, you have to reduce it and do a vascularized bone graft, vascularized graft or bone graft. Remember that there is a there is a there is a buzzword called sood heals with sood. So you have to change the dynamics of the bone over there. Either you have to transfer a good bone over there, or either you will do a bone graft. You have to do something. You have to resect that sood arthrosis and fix it. So neurofibromatosis criteria is six or more cafeolate spots, two or more neurofibromas, or one plexiform fibroma. Axillary fracking, lish nodules in the eye, tibial pseudarthrosis, and genetic positive. So in, in your talk station, in your short cases, if the patient comes, you have to show him that you will see the axilla, see the back for cafeolate spot. And the most common, another deformity, which is with neurofibromatosis, is spine. So you have to examine the spine. If he asks you what you are doing, I want to see the spine. Why you want to see the spine? Scoliosis is more common neurofibromatosis. If he asks you why you're seeing axilla, this will make him diagnosis. Why, why we refer to ophthalmology? I want to confirm lisp nodules. So these are things they can, just on a clinical basis, they can assess. So how you prognosticate, they did not ask me this in the exam. This is a difficult question, but still I'm telling you, you should know it. It depends on the age the type per void classification, neurofibromatosis positive or negative, uh, dysplastic lesions, multiple surgical approaches, limb length problems, and malalignment problems. So the principle of pseudarthrosis is resect the pseudarthrosis, correct the limb length and axial alignment, and achieve a fusion, rigid fusion. So you can achieve it. The best option is Elizarov, by the way. But you should be very careful because then he, your question and answers will start from Il, to, in Elizarov. And if you don't know Elizarov, don't tell him. So for me, I told him I will do a plating and bone grafting. He told me what else I told him I can use BMPs. And that was it. But otherwise, William Rods, he told me, he asked me that what else we can do. So what else is the best is Elizarov? It addressed the limb length, achieve union, and correct the deformity. Uh, Elizarov can be like Elizarov, like ring fixator or hybrid fixator or Taylor's partial frame. William rods are very now. You have to uh, uh, fix the the physis. The problem is that you you have to have a long rod to have a rigid fixation. Uh, plating is one option, but plating as per trials, it's uh, it uh, it does not have that good results. 
but I saved my ass by saying plating because I, I thought he will ask me plating, what is compression plating, and that's it. I will save. And that was right. It was okay. This is another question. Uh, this is basically a x ray showing left Bertie's disease. So the, 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 the problem with this x ray is that I, instead of going for conservative during exam, he told me, What is this? I told him, This is, looks like there is this finding, these findings. What you will do with it? So I, for me, what mistake I did over here is I directly jumped into surgery. And actually, he told me what, in which patient you will do surgeries. And I was told him that I will do the surgery in head and wrist signs. Patient having head at wrist signs. He told me, is there any head and wrist sign over here? There is no head and wrist signs over here. So then after I went for the conservative like Scottish right brace or abduction orthosis. So etiology, it's like the cause, the reason is genetic inheritance, thrombophilia, vascular deficiency, environmental factors, endocrine factors, microtrauma, and collagen 2 deficiency. So why it happens? This is the blood supply of a femoral head in a pedia. If you note, the age 0 to 4, 0 to 4 years of age, the medial and lateral, lateral circumflex femoral artery and the ligamentum teres all are supplying the femoral head. Then there is a shift from 4, age 4 to adult. And the shift is that the posterior superior and posterior inferior retinacular vessels from MCFA, medial circumflex femoral artery, becomes the major blood supply. And LCFA becomes lower. And ligamentum teres becomes negligible. So during this change, something happens that which causes birth disease. The blood supply reduces and it causes an AVN in a pedia case. An AVN in a pediatric case is birth disease. Head address sign is obese. This was, he asked me this question, what are head address signs? So clinically, if the patient is obese, recurrent admissions, adductor contracture and extension, flexion with abduction. A radiological find is gauge sign. There is a weak lucency in lateral physis. Physis is horizontal, or there is calcification lateral to the physis, or metaphysical cysts, or increased medial clear space. So he asked me herring classification, and I told him the herring classification as simple as that A, B, and C. So A is normal height of lateral pillar, B is partial prolapse, less than 50%, and C is severe, not prolapse, it's collapse less than 50% remaining. Um, remember that there is BC also, when now the middle part of is, 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 is more collapsed than the lateral part, then it's BC. So the general factor is less than six, all patients will do well. Six to eight years of age benefits from containment, if not contained, and more than eight typically don't do well. So six to eight is your phase in which you mostly patient will need surgical intervention to improve the prognosis. So treatment, medical treatment for PERTIS is biphosphonates, BMP2 and 7, osteoprotecrin, bracing, petri cast, Scottish right brace, or in Pakistan it's abduction orthosis. Uh, surgery is to prevent head and wrist signs. So, proximal femoral varus osteotomy or shelf osteotomy or orthobiasis uh, depends where the femoral, the, the, the problem is in the femur, head or acetabulum. And most of the, these interventions like arthrodiasis, diasis is, is a bit controversial. So, we can only, you can only jump onto PFPO, varus osteotomy. So, this is preventive surgery. Remedial surgery is, is containment phase has passed. So you can do chelectomy, um, abduction extension, proximal femoral osteotomy, or salvage like procedure like osteoplasty. So this was another case for me in trauma in pedia. So he told this, describe this x-ray, and you can see this, uh, this is saltarellus type. Looks like two fracture. So we had to discuss this. Uh, I'm sorry again. It's okay. 
so he asked me classify what are your concerns here by classifying and how you plan this patient what are the side effects of not reducing it so this is Salter classification you should remember this is a simple Salter without any um, addition of rang or ogden and that's enough you have to remember these five because these are time tested concern is that distal femur grows at 0.9 mm per year highest in all lower limbs so limb length discrepancy is a issue this physis distal femur physis indulating it's not a straight line so we are not sure that this is salter has type 2 or a component of type 2 and 3 the other thing is the closure may not be complete causing complex type of salter has component this age the child age was i think so 14 or 15 13 or 14 so it can be a triplan just like ankle having salter has type 2 and 3 together so i told him that we need a ct scan for this patient and the operative intervention all roams around the fixing the proximal fragment this is called thurston holland component so you will fix it with the, with the screws through the thurston holland component and you will not the screw should not pass the vices problem is limb length and angular deformities this was another exam case for me and uh, this was they told me it was 11 year old child and what are your findings so i told them there is a lytic lesion in the epiphysis and uh, the zone of transition there is no fracture and zone of transition is, uh, is quite evident over there it was quite evident at that time and there was something like soap and bubble sort of appearance also and he told me what is your diagnosis and he told, i told him i don't i have different diagnosis so he told me what is your different diagnosis so the first different diagnosis which i told them was giant cell tumor which giant cell tumor does not occur in 13 or 15 years of child so you should go for a chondroblastoma the younger brother of giant cell tumor so what are the findings three months history benign or malignant what tumor it can be what surgery you will do what approach you will do and describe that approach these were the questions which asked me so the first mistake i did is i jumped to giant gct which is wrong then regarding benign or malignant it's definitely benign so what type of tumor it can be? I was wrong. I said giant cell tumor. This is a typical chondroblastoma. What surgery will do? I, I told him I will do the biopsy and then I will go for a dependent diagnosis. He told him this is the result and it should be chondroblastoma. So I told him I will, I will do curatage and bone, extending curatage and bone grafting. But I, the approach which I told him that was, was the uh, deltoid-splitting approach. Actually, it was medial uh, uh, deltobacterial group approach. So remember these findings that well-defined sclerotic borders go for benign and when there is interrupted periostal reactions go for malignant. Uh, geographical destructive bone lesion with, with, the, with the narrow zone of transition you should go for benign, wide zone of transition you should go for malignant. So this was chondroblastoma, younger brother of GCT, epiphyseal or apophyseal, young age less than 30, or x-ray see the physis just always see the physis if the physis is open go for chondroblastoma instead of gct need to exclude infections uh fleck of calcification eccentric placed histology will show chicken wire calcification or cobblestone appear appearance stains with s100 treatments extended curatage with bone blaster even if physis is involved and there is a chance of giving metastasis to the lungs and legends may have abc with it this is another case Interestingly, this has a genuine welcome. And he asked me findings on X-ray, how you examine, what are the risks or etiology, and how to plan to approach if the patient is nine years old. So basically, first you have to note that vulgus, if it's unilateral or bilateral, examine in standing, not in bed. And causes can be physiological or pathological. Uh, this is a small graph. This showing the knee whereas deformity at birth going into vulgus at 20 to 24 months and then again changing into a, a reduced reduction of a vulgus at the age of eight to normal adult peak so you have to remember that not all patients with vulgus deformity are to be operated so unilateral is taught this was from my what i remember trauma osteomyelitis tumor if genuvalgum is there, you can put trauma, osteomyelitis, and tumor. 
bilateral is sit pine or physiological. Sit pine means congenital disorder. It can be idiopathic, developmental like epiphyseal dysplasia, paralytic like polio, inflammatory like rheumatoid arthritis, metabolic like rickets, endocrine like thyroid disorders. So when you assess this, these patients, you have to measure the intermedular distance. 8 to 10 centimeters is normal limit. Anything above 10 centimeters is well less needed. You have to draw a plumb line and it should be at the middle of the joint, of the, of the, of the ankle joint. Um, there is a knee flexion test. If you do flex the knee and it disappears, the vulgus deformity disappears, this means it's in the fever. If it stays there and does not disappear, this means it's in tibia. Uh, for exam, remember that less than 4 you don't do any treatment. 4 to 10, you do heel raise or knock knee brace. I'm sorry for the spelling mistakes. Uh, 10 to 14 years, you do epiphyseal stapling. 14 to 16, late for stapling and early for osteotomy. So you wait till he is more than 16 and you do osteotomy. Okay, this is a, this is a patient. He, they showed, he, they, she showed me the x-ray and he showed me what is the deformity, what are the causes, what treatment for 60 years, diabetic, workup, approach, and medial release step. And what is the difference between rheumatoid arthritis and what is referencing? If the referencing was not asked for me, all these other questions were asked for me. So this uh, various deformed knee, right various knee with sclerosis, you can see my marginal osteophytes formation and the joint center medial side is completely uh, obliterated. So probably it's uh, osteoarthritic knee. So pre-op workup, you work up baseline all the investigations which you do normally in the patient. Uh, you include standing bilateral knee, extension and flexion, lateral x-ray, sunrise view to assess for the pattern of femoral osteoarthritis. And if you suspect lateral ligaments stretch out, you should do a single length, single weight bearing x-ray. Uh, Pre-op HB1AC, you can talk about this diabetic assessment. Remember that uh, if your blood sugar, the patient's blood sugar is more than 250, it causes redu reduction in collagen synthesis. If above 200, it can increase the chance of infection. So above 250 means that collagen synthesis or healing will not occur, and infection, the patient's predisposed for infection also. Body mass index, you, re you should remember that patients who have above 35 BMI in, in total knee replacements would fail earlier than before. And approach, normally just keep, just remember that medial parapetal approach and leave the others because you have many approaches to remember. So medial, the steps of medial release are, first is you remove the osteophytes, then you remove the deep MCL, then you remove the posterior medial corner, then you, in the posterior medial corner, this, and then you go for superficial MCL. Posterior medial corner, this semi tendinosus and capsule. And then, you remove the superficial MCL. Superficial MCL has two parts. As you know, that it's, it's, it's attached to the, to the proximal tibia and the proximal oblique part is tight in extension and the anterior portion is tight in flexion. So if the patient has tightness in extension, you remove the posterior oblique part. If you have a patient who has tight in flexion, you remove the anterior portion. What is the difference between valgus knee surgery and varus knee? It's not just the different type of angulation. The total surgery became, becomes completely complicated and different. So simple as that, valgus knee is tight at, at lateral aspect. The MCL is attenuated and lengthened. In the medial, in the varus deformity, uh, basically the medial, uh, the lateral ligaments are loose. The other thing is that uh, release is different in varus and valgus knee. In varus knee, you release from tibia. In valgus knee, you release more from femur. Uh, referencing can become difficult as lateral femoral cradle is hypoplastic in rheumatoid arthritis. The disease is symmetrical in rheumatoid arthritis. The bone is weaker in rheumatoid arthritis. There is more bone loss. loss. And implant type, can be preferences can be different. You can go on to have a PCL uh, retaining total knee replacement, but if you have a 
symmetrical osteoarthritis or tricompartment osteoarthritis, you would prefer to go for a posterior stabilized knee at a minimum. So referencing is basically a technique for setting center of rotation and balancing the sagittal plane in the knee, in the knee replacement. So there are four, five types of basically, we don't use gap balancing, but it's noted. So there is an AP axis white side line, which is used most commonly. Then is epicondylar axis, then is posterior condyle axis, then is tibial alignment axis, where you do the osteotomy with the tibial jig and you lift it up and then do the osteotomy with the femur. And the gap balancing techniques, techniques where you, flexion, you check the flexion extension gap. This is the, another situation which came as compartmental syndrome. So remember the six P's that is paresthesia, spalar, pulsenesis, poikilothermia, and paralysis. And the most important pain out of proportion. Uh, they asked me when to measure compartment. The patient is obtunted, comatose. The patient is uh, how to measure when to measure compartment. So the answer is that uh, in obtunted patient, comatose patient, non-emergent cases or unequivocal cases or OR settings, you can check the compartment pressure. Otherwise, there is no need. It's a, it's basically a clinical ent entity, and you can revise by the audio message I sent to you, people. So this was another station. Uh, this is basically a, a C5 over C6 uh, fracture dis dislocation. So the, he will ask you to describe this X-ray. He asked me to describe this X-ray, and I told him evident finding is that there is a dislocation. How much dislocation? I think I commented 25% dislocation. 25% uh, is end displacement. So it's a unilateral facet dislocation. So always when this comes in, exam you should talk about ATLS. Uh, you should also talk about the clinical assessment, neurology, neurological deficit. Uh, you have to remember the, the to draw the lines. Anterior vertebral line, posterior vertebral line, spinal lemon line. You should draw these lines and try to keep on remember these three lines so that you it's easy for you. Uh, always comment on the space between the two vertebras, that is the disc, if it's visible or it is lost. If it is lost, this means that there is a disc retropulsion either into the, in, 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 into the spinal cord. So he asked me findings, how will you approach this patient? MRI or no MRI? The patient is obtunted, is disoriented, change management. And the last question was how you apply Gartner one so basically, this is a C4, C5 dislocation, less than 25% unilateral facet. If more than 50% displacement is bilateral. What is the significance? Unilateral facet dislocation will reduce easily. Uh, sorry, unilateral facet dislocation will reduce difficult, but will be stable. Bilateral dislocation will be easy to reduce, but would be unstable. The PCL, the posterior. Uh, uh, component would have ligamentous component will be lost in more than 50 percent. So, the, one of the patient will come with myelopathy that is bilateral, and the unilateral would come with as as radiculopathy unilateral or bilateral. This is not a hard fast rule, but clinically you can say that most of the patient will come as myelopathy. So approach is different for awake, cooperative, and comatose and obtunded patients. So alert, alert patient is for reduction. If you have a patient who is alert, oriented, and there is the, the, the patient is, 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 is cooperative, you should reduce it. Comatose and disoriented is planned. It should be planned. It should be reduced in the OR. Approach is different for neurovascular deficit versus no deficit. If there is a deficit, you should reduce the dislocation. If there is no deficit, you can go for further investigations. So end result is the, uh, when you add up these two factors, any patient alert, oriented, with the radiculopathy is for reduction. Anyone who is obtunted, with or without radiculopathy, because we cannot examine him, is for further planning.
am I right whether we should do or not do? So it should always be performed before surgical stabilization to assess the position of the disc. If the PLI is involved or not involved and the compression at the bottom. Because the approach is different. For a one which has disc excluded, you have to go approach anterior and posterior. But for the one which has no disc, you have to go posterior. So the last question which he, he asked me was how we reduce if the patient is alert, oriented, and there is a radicular. So the answer is that the, this is not a simple reduction of dislocation. It is a, by experienced staff. Uh, it needs controlled environment under image, adequate anesthesia, relaxants, I mean, frequent neuro neurovascular assessment. It should be under lateral sleeve C arm and there should be a flexion torque at C-spine. I will apply gatherer tongs and I will apply weight. The first 10, it's not kg, sorry. For, for an adult of 75 kg, I will put first 10 pounds for the head and then increments of 5 pounds every 20, 25 minutes. This is a normal protocol. Uh, I'm, I don't remember from where I read this protocol, but this is this was the protocol but when i told him he was extremely happy so normally 10 pounds for the head and then five pounds increments he asked me when this would reduce so i told him that every level has five pounds so i expect that about 30 pounds maximum the patient's dislocation will reduce uh, you have to confirm these before going for exam so he asked me when you stop i told him if it's not reducing and the neurology is deteriorating. So that's it. Thank you.